Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Green. I am the Alumni Engagement Manager at Grazadio. Grateful to have you all here with us today for navigating your career in a virtual world series. This is Ignite Yourself as an Influential Leader. Today's session is session four of six, and the series is designated to assist you in your career journey, whether you are working from home, possibly looking for new opportunities, seeking to transition in your career, or just refresh your skills to reinvent yourself. This series is for you, and we're glad that you are here today. I would like to mention a few reminders before we get started. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded and there will be event photography taking place. If you are not interested in being recorded or part of the event photography, please feel free to turn your camera off. In addition to that, we have a networking form that will be shared in the chat, so please feel free to fill that out. That will allow you to connect with those that are attending this session a little bit further on LinkedIn and through some of our social media um, platforms. So please fill that out. And then I encourage you as the panelists are presenting today, we have a stellar panel. I encourage you to drop your questions in the chat. I will be monitoring that and filtering questions once the presentations have concluded for the panelists to address as many questions as possible. All right. So today's panelists, um, they're gonna speak on such great content. Um, the speakers will touch upon their personal journey um, and how Grazia Deal supported their endeavors, as well as offer insight to understand your leadership style, unlock your self-awareness, enhance your emotional intelligence, and ignite yourself as an influential leader with the capacity to lead effectively. So let's go ahead and meet today's speakers. Our first panelist is Emily Isensi, who currently serves as a Senior Manager of Sales Enablement at Tableau, leading a team that drives the learning and leadership strategy for sales for the sales organization. She previously worked for Brave Leaders Incorporated, Brene Brown's online learning community, helping organizations integrate Brene's e-courses into their talent development strategy to create braver leaders and more courageous cultures. Emily also worked with the learning and development team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she managed a foundation-wide award-winning leadership development program. Welcome, Emily. Our next panelist is Susan Fleetwood, who serves as the Senior Organizational Development Director at Microsoft Corporation and has more than 30 years of experience in professional services, consulting, and organizational effectiveness with demonstrated ability to lead, influence, and create alignment, resulting in accelerated business growth and performance. Her experiences include planning and deployment of large-scale systems, integration projects, business strategy development and execution, strategic change facilitation, organization design and consulting, individual and team development across a variety of industries, high tech, healthcare, communications, petroleum, and travel. Welcome, Susan. Our final panelist is James Jackman, who serves as the Vice President of Operations and Executive Coach for the Heffelfinger Company, where leadership, development, and coaching have been the core of their firm from the beginning. They work with organizations committed to developing talent and strategies to build great teams and strengthen business. Their team brings wonderful, wonderfully diverse backgrounds and accomplishments from large corporate, large corporate settings to entrepreneurial ventures. Their clients value purpose yet understand the importance of profit. Wow, welcome again to our panelists part of the MSOD community, part of the Grazia Dio family. Thank you for being here. I will now turn it over to Emily. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I am so excited to be with this crew. And now that you've learned a little bit about us and the panelists, we wanna learn just a little bit more about you. So we're gonna do a quick poll to understand what brought you here today. What inspired you to show up at today's event? Um, so Nicole's opened up that poll. It's on your screen. Go ahead and click which option um, 
is a reason that you are here. We look forward to kind of, you know, well, we don't have time to do intros from everyone. We at least can learn one small thing about you here as well. So awesome. Make sure you get your response. We've heard from about half of you. So take a minute to fill up that poll. We'd love to hear from all of you about what brought you here today. Awesome. Take about 10 more seconds to get your answer and then we'll close the poll. It looks like we have most people we've heard from. All right. So Nicole, you wanna go ahead and close the poll. So it looks like uh, we have a tie. 52% of you were here because you're pursuing a new career in industry. And then also 52% want to grow your network. I know those add up to more than 100%, but that's because you could pick multiple ones. So great to see that. Um, we look forward to, I'm always interested in growing my um, network. So look forward to connecting with you as well. Um, and hopefully this will help provide some more insight on how you pursue that new career in industry. So welcome everyone. All right, so with that, um, I'll go ahead and dive in a little bit and share a little bit more. You heard about my career and some of the things I've done, but as I prepared for today's session, um, what I was really reflecting on was the influ influential leaders in my life and my career. And what I realized is one of the big themes in my career is I have always looked for opportunities to work for, to support, to learn from influential leaders. And as I look at the different leaders and bosses I've had over the years, that's definitely a commonality that they've had. So I look forward to sharing a little bit more. Part of what attracted me to these various leaders has been this idea that they are, they take leadership very seriously. They value being a leader and the role and the responsibility that carries. They really are focused on empowering the people that work for them and supporting their teams. They are focused on building the team and they're focused on getting to know their stakeholders, meeting them where they are at um, and influencing others. And so that's really helped me, um, you know, thrive in my career is by getting to know these leaders and have taught me a lot of great skills on my own. Um, one of my early uh, leaders at the Gates Foundation, um, she was actually the one who early on in starting there, I started there as an entry level role an assistant, temporary assistant, um, an HR, um, very entry level, but she sat me down early on in my time there and said, what do you want to do with your career? Um, and I was just so impressed by that because I hadn't really thought about it. And she really asked me some key questions and, and continued that conversation with me the whole time that I was at the foundation and the four years I was able to really grow my career under her guidance. And the other thing that she did that I will forever be grateful for is after I kind of figured out what I wanted to do and did some um, like courses here, moved up, finally decided I wanted to be in the learning and development space. She sat me down and said, okay, it's time for you to go to grad school. It's time for you to get a little more education in this space. And that's actually what um, brought me to Pepperdine as I decided I didn't want to get a degree just in learning and development. I wanted to go a little bit broader. And so that's what led me to the organizational development program. Um, at Pepperdine, and it was a phenomenal experience, changed my life, helped me really grow my network. And so I will forever be grateful for her and that nudge and that push to go into um, this program and now be a part of the alumni community. Um, so with that, I wanna go ahead and share some other tips that I've learned in my time um, in, uh, my career and from some of these inspirational leaders that I have shared about. So the first thing um, is anchoring in your values. As you heard, and when Nicole shared my bio, um, I did have the opportunity to work and partner with Brene Brown for a few years. And this is something I truly learned from her. It's this whole concept of getting super clear and clarifying your values and then anchoring every step, every decision you make in your career in those values. I, again, had an amazing opportunity at the Gates Foundation to do my first values workshop. I'd never heard of this before, but there's a whole exercise they took us through. Um, and I was able to clarify that my top values that span both my personal and professional life are connection, wholeheartedness, and making a difference. And every single time I think about what I want to do in my career versus both in my role and taking the next step, 
I'm always thinking about how do things align with those core values. The other thing that this has been really helpful for me personally is to ensuring that as I establish and come to find my leadership style over the years, that I anchor in those values. And one story that I like to share around this is I remember when I first stepped into a formal people leader role, there were some folks around me, other leaders who talked about, you know, you can't be friends with your employees. You just like, you need to be the boss. They're your employees. You can't be their friends. And that didn't feel right with me. I so valued connection and I was taking over a team of my peers that I already was friends with and that I already felt like I had connection with. And part of my wholeheartedness value is like, I'm all in, like, I want to be your friend. Let's work together. I think the workplace is more enjoyable when you're friends with the people you work with. And so at first I was like, I need to create these boundaries. But then I realized that I could be friends and I could create boundaries, my direct reports within those relationships and manage those things. So that is an example of how I needed to use my values to show up authentically. The second one, again, aligns with one of my values. But it's about always making time for connection. This has been something that I have learned and I think has been so valuable for me in being a leader. And um, it really helps you be more self-aware by making time for connection, be more socially aware, creating those relationships by having that time for connection. I find sometimes in the workplace, it's like immediately, let's get down to business, let's work. But you get closer with people and you build trust, which helps you in your work by making connection. So I really have tried to prioritize starting meetings with some sort of way of connecting with people. It can be as short as what we just did here, a little poll, so you can at least start a little bit of connection. Or I do, I'm a huge fan of different check-in questions. In my team, team meetings right now, we spend 20 minutes at the start of our hour meeting just talking about how we're doing, what's going on, tell me something good. Um, and that's how we spend time to create that connection. Because especially in a virtual environment, it's so much, so important to create that time. Um, this is actually something I also studied in my degree um, program is a colleague in mine, Amanda Cipriano. Um, we realized that there were some groups we were working in, team groups that were working really well and other groups that weren't working well. And so we wanted to figure out what that was about. And so um, we ultimately learned that it anchored in connection. We created a whole model of what was working well. We called it the virtual learning relationship model. But what was the key ingredient was the teams that were the most successful spent time truly getting to know each other and creating that connection. So again, that's one of my key tips. And this is a great way to help you be able to better influence your career using those connections that you created. Number three, meeting people where they're at, especially your stakeholders. This is something that it's taken me a while to learn. And I still have moments where I, I don't do this great. But, um, and I, something I also coach a lot of people on how to do this better, people that I mentor and people who work for me. Um, oftentimes, especially in my world where I've studied how people work, I've studied how people work in business, I've studied how teams work. I often know I'm like, here's where you need to go. I also know a lot about learning and development. I'm like, here's where you need to be. Here's what good looks like. But someone's all the way over here and they're not ready to get there yet. And if you try and bring them all the way over, they're just gonna resist and you're not gonna make any progress. So it's about finding out what's important to people and what, what they're thinking about and what their perspective is, meeting them there, and then maybe inviting them one step in the direction that you want to go or the direction that you think is best for the business, the project, or whatnot from there. Um, I had a great experience about four years ago with this where um, I was new at my current role at Tableau. I had this SVP I had to partner with on a lot of our leader programs, our leadership development programs our leadership development workshops, and we were just butting heads because he wanted things done one way and I thought things needed to be done another way to meet the objectives he was giving me. And finally, when I sat down and said, hey, I just want a conversation, I call it a designed alliance to get to know you. When I sat down and had that conversation, all of a sudden I could understand exactly where he was and how to better influence him and move him along in the direction that I wanted to go, but also learn from him too and take some of the insights he wanted in our plan. Um, and so that kind of combines, that was like that time for connection and meeting him where he was at. First, I had to understand where he was at in order to help us be successful in creating these leadership development programs. Three years later, we've been working really well together. And it's finally got to a place where he gives me general direction and now trusts me to go. Because that whole experience also helped us build a lot of trust. 
the fourth thing, thing that's super essential that I've learned, and I, you'll see it like kind of a theme throughout all of these, is this whole idea of being your authentic self. And that's how I think it's really important when you build your network. Um, there's always these tips or trips of like what you should do on your network, what, what like what's gonna work, what's helpful. The reality is do what's best and what works for you. For me, I love in-person events. That means this last year has been really, really hard. But while I'm kind of active on LinkedIn and I like try to make sure my LinkedIn's good, that's not where I'm really growing my network. Where I'm growing my network is going to events like this now in the virtual world. But I also love, I live in Seattle. So I've gone to some of the Pepperdine events in Seattle. They've been super valuable. We, the MSOD program actually has our own conference that I've gone to um, the last few years. And that's been an amazing place to, again, connect with people and build my network that way. And then the other way that's been helpful for me, that's been authentic to me, is talking to people within my network and asking for connections with other people who have similar interests to me or are interested in something that I want to learn more. And so that's what's worked for me. Find what works for you when it comes to building your network, not just doing what people say you should do. And the last thing is never stop learning. Um, I am a lifelong learner. This is why I'm in the world of learning and development. So it's essential that I continue to model the work that I do. Um, and this looks a lot of different ways. It's formal programs. It was my master's degree. It's now I'm in a, a coaching certification program through the Coactive Training Institute. Uh, I'm doing a leadership development program, um, one of our executive leadership development programs offered by my company. And then I'm also gathering feedback. I'm talking to others. I have mentors. All these different ways that I'm learning. And I feel like that's how we can continue to be a more um, emotionally intelligent and um, also more confident in our roles. And also it helps you, again, always come back to a connection. You'll see that that's a big theme with me. So those are a few of my tips. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Susan to continue to build on and share some of her tips when it comes to influential leadership. Great. Thanks so much, Emily. I really loved listening to all your tips and so many of those resonate with me as well. Um, you know, I've been fortunate um, over the years to have a real diverse um, career experience across many different industries. Um, that's what I really enjoy is just having a lot of variety in the type of work that I do. Um, you know, um, from my early days of career, I uh, changed professions quite often. Um, coming out of school, I was a software developer, um, then became uh, internal auditor, um, then went to consulting, project management. Um, and then uh, about, I guess it was about 15 years ago, um, kind of had this reflection moment in terms of what did I wanted to do with my life when I grew up um, and uh, really kind of got super interested in this whole field of organization development um, and went back to school through Pepperdine and um, through the amazing MSOD program to, to get my graduate degree. So, um, you know, it's been quite a journey since then. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is really, you know, to focus on some tips that have really been helpful for me, particularly, you know, during, um, you know, the past year and a half as we have, you know, been, we still are in a global pandemic. And then just, you know, what does that mean in terms of how to operate in this virtual, this new virtual world, um, you know, in these, in these more challenging times, um, you know, we um, certainly, we went, um, I guess it was last March, when we were kind of sent home and we were, you know, other than essential workers that needed to come into the office. So it was this really, for me personally, it was this huge shift. Um, I mean, I would typically go into the office every, every day, every week. Um, and so, um, you know, having to kind of make this, this huge transition and again, not knowing, you know, what was happening with the, with the global pandemic, how long would this last? Um, so, you know, initially it was, you know, kind of this novelty um, and, you know, that was kind of easy to adjust to, but, um, you know, over time, I really found myself um, struggling to, you know, to really adapt, you know, kind of being um, isolated, uh, alone, um, and just kind of wondering when are things ever going to return to normal. Um, you may have heard the phrase, you know, I was literally, you know, sleeping where I worked. So there was really no separation of, you know, of, of boundaries and so on. Um, so again, um, as I go through some of these tips that have helped me from a, you know, from a personal perspective as well from as well as from a leadership perspective, um, I hope that they'll, um, you know, you'll have some takeaways for you as well. Um, and so first and foremost, I would start is, um, and this to me is has become something that um, 
I do all the time now, which is really prioritize your own well-being. Um, so again, um, you know, with uh, working at home and really not um, not being able to draw those boundaries in terms of, you know, I don't have a commute anymore. You know, I was um, certainly super busy at work. I was also being a, I was a learning group consultant through our MSOD program. So I had school going on. Um, you know, it just, uh, all of those things became all consuming. And I, you know, frankly, kind of lost myself in, in a lot of that. So, you know, through the summer, um, once we got through a lot of our big uh, uh, milestones at school and as well as work, I found myself just, you know, completely drained, exhausted, um, and really, um, you know, struggling to kind of get myself back, back, back on ground. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm so grateful for with my manager in this, she, you know, again, as, as uh, Emily mentioned, you know, the leaders that you work for are so influential, um, uh, you know, was just in incredibly caring. Um, you know, one of our, our principles for our managers at Microsoft is around modeling, coaching, and caring. And so my manager was just um, so incredible in terms of the caring, encouraging me to take time off, um, really kind of reset myself and um, really kind of get back into this. Okay, how do I, how do I really prioritize my well-being um, over time? So, you know, it really, um, since last summer, um, you know, I've really, that's been a huge focus for me, you know, getting back into my exercise routines, meditation. I have this little post-it note here. I don't, you know, some of you may have seen it from about a year ago from, uh, these are not my quarantine questions, but um, I thought they were so powerful. They kind of made the rounds on Twitter. Um, uh, they originated from a photojournalist named Brooke Anderson, um, who was in the, uh, who lives in the Bay Area in California. Um, and so these were just some questions that, you know, she, she posed that she would ask herself each day. Um, and so, you know, these were some of the things that I adopted and I've shared those broadly. Um, we've used them in our team meetings as well, um, similar to what Emily had mentioned um, we start each of our uh, our meetings at work with a check-in um, and a check-out, um, just to kind of you know again prioritizing our well-being not just for us individually but for the entire team. So um, you know that's just um, I can't under underestimate kind of how important that is. Um, it's kind of that adage of you know when you're flying on an airplane, you put your oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help others. So again, um, you know that's uh, again just just so amazing. Um, so uh, secondly, then um, just in terms of tips is really, you know, again, kind of building on what Emily mentioned earlier around, you know, um, understanding and getting clear on your values in order to be kind of your authentic self. Um, building on that is also clarifying your purpose, um, right? So in terms of, you know, what is it, what is it that really gives you, um, energy that really fuels your passions. You know, it's interesting, we do a lot of this, you know, values work with organizations and mission and vision. Uh, you can also apply those same principles to yourself. And so, um, you know, I've really spent time also in terms of kind of, okay, what, what do I really want to focus on? You know, what's really important to me? You know, it really kind of helps, uh, has helped me get grounded um, in terms of what's important for me. Um, and so, uh, you know, going through the Pepperdine program many years ago was um, really kind of an awakening into really discovering my purpose and what was important to me in life. Um, and so mine is to strive to be a loving, healing presence to others. And I recently added and to our planet. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'm, you know, super focused on or passionate about is, you know, just the health of our planet and the longevity of of us you know, in, in this world. So um, again, just getting clear on kind of your purpose and your, you know, that becomes really your North Star in terms of, you know, where, you, how you want to live your life and, and where you want to go. I mean, it's one thing to actually, you know, create a purpose, but it's yet another to really live it, live into it, use that to guide your decisions and, and your choices in life. 
Um, so having a, uh, you know, the, the purpose is, is certainly important. Um, one of the things that I've also done is kind of build uh, my own personal board of directors. You, you may have heard of this concept. Um, you know, this board really acts as a, as a sounding board um, to advise you on feedback, you know, about your life decisions, opportunities, challenges, that type of thing. And oftentimes, you know, it's helpful to have that unfiltered feedback. Instead of, it's easy to kind of go to people that you know that may give, tell you what you maybe want to hear all the time. Um, but, you know, it really kind of uh, helps to kind of have that, that uh uh, that additional perspective. Um, I've also tried to, I'm still building mine, um, but also want to have a lot of uh, different and diverse uh, perspectives in there as well. So again, that I'm not hearing kind of, um, or going to the same group of folks. Um, so, uh, you know, I've asked one of my former managers to be on my personal board of directors. Um, and so she's been super helpful to help me think through kind of what that looks like. I mean, she's a head of HR for a, a different company. And so she has a board also. So it's, it's been great to kind of compare notes and such. Um, and then the other you know, you know, uh, tip number four is, you know, really kind of recruiting and having um, those accountability partners. Um, and so I've asked her to also be my accountability partner. So um, oftentimes we, uh, we live in the same neighborhood. So we go walking in the evenings. And so she will uh, almost always ask me, how am I doing? How am I progressing? How's my board coming along? Who have I reached out to or not and why? <laughs> With some gentle coaching questions along the way. Um, but again, just as a uh, you know, as a, as a leader, and um, I think this is super helpful to kind of have those different perspectives to help guide you um, along the way. Um, I've seen the value that, that she has, has um, gotten from, from having this, uh, this board of directors and how it's, you know, helped shape her, uh, shaped her decisions uh, from a career perspective. And it's something that, um, you know, I'm on her board. And so it's, it's helpful to, to, in that regard, to, to compare notes. Um, and, you know, again, you can have accountability partners on just about anything. I mean, back to kind of the, the prioritizing um, the well-being. One of the things I asked a friend of mine to do, a running buddy of mine to do was to be an accountability buddy as, um, you know, as I focused on my self-care. Um, and one of those was around, you know, committing to do yoga three times a week. And so she, she and I were accountability buddies for about four months. You know, we would set some, you know, initial goals and, you know, tried to have some fun with it as well. Um, we would celebrate as we, as we uh, achieved those accomplishments. Um, although by, you know, by the time April rolled around, I decided I was kind of done with that. <laughs> and so I was going to take a break um, because it, it, uh, it had become more of a chore. Um, so I think it's also important to realize kind of where is it working for you and where is it not um, and to, you know, be able to kind of revisit those decisions if it's uh, if you're not really deriving the value out of it that you expected. Um, and then the last piece. Um, it's really around leading with inclusion or being inclusive. Um, again, I kind of tie this back to the context of op operating in this virtual world. You know, so many of us have made, had to make, you know, adjustments and it's been so challenging for so many um, during the past 15 months or so, you know, working in a different type of environment, especially, you know, folks that have children at home or parents that they're taking care of or can't see. I mean, it's just been, it's been incredible. And as we think about kind of the, you know, future of work, this, you know, shift to more hybrid work, um, you know, it really is an opportunity, you know, uh, to think about leadership and influencing in different ways um, in this new world. And so how do we embed that inclusiveness, you know, in throughout the organization, how we work, how we think, how we, how we behave, um, uh, you know, in this, in this environment, because, you know, quite frankly, um, you know, we can't really rely on those old norms again, the, the you know, the eight to five or kind of that traditional work day um, really is no more, right? I think it's, you know, we can say it's changed for good um, and really to, you know, be competitive in this, in this new world, you know, we as leaders need to embrace flexibility in terms of people, you know, when they work, where they work, how they work. Um, you know, flexibility is really kind of the, the key now, um, you know, again, to create that environment where people feel respected, where they can do their best work. Um, you know, what's the culture that you want to be part of? 
as well as what do you want to create, right? What's the culture you want to create? So um, in many ways, um, you know, the, um, you know, with this pandemic and stuff and all, it's been kind of a, uh, an opportunity to really equalize that experience. Um, you know, technology can certainly help. Um, and in fact, I think that has, um, you know, really given uh, folks a, a voice um, that maybe they didn't have previously, um, just in terms of, you know, getting them engaged, making sure that we're hearing from all the folks that are, um, you know, part of the, the community um, to create that environment that's supportive, it's empowering, um, and it's also respectful. So, um, again, those are just a, a few things that have um, tips that I've learned over the past um, year and a half or so. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, there's some nuggets in there that you'll be able to take away with um, um, that'll be useful for you as well. So with that, I'm going to hand off to James. James, you're on mute, just so you know. <laughs> A year and a half working at home through a computer, and I still leave the mute button on. That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so that was my whole talk. I'm, I'm good, everybody, right? So actually not. So uh, James Jackman, um, I'm Vice President of Operations, a nice big title in a nice small company, uh, and also an executive coach. And in that, the executive coach is really um, I believe it was uh, uh, Susan said, find your, your purpose. And I think that has been one of the, my uh, biggest finds of my lifetime is that I'm actually, I, I want to coach. I did all kinds of things and I'll, it goes in a little bit my story to, to become a coach. So uh, that, was, that was something that, that uh, took something from me to make that happen. But uh, actually, if you could put up my uh, my tips here, um, and and the reason I wanted the, the the tips up is when I started my career a few years ago, um, the the saying was go get a good job at a good company and you'll never have to look for another look for work again. You'll just work for them till you retire. You'll end up with a great pension, and you'll your life will be great. And then somewhere along in my career time, it switched over to become an expert at what you do and then go get jobs at other companies. And that's how you'll improve your financial standing or, you know, when you find companies where you can improve your expertise. Then, it, then time went on a little bit longer and it was no longer talking about companies. We weren't telling our, the young people to go work for, it was find the industry, get that expertise, go work in your industry. And it, you know, and now it is whatever it is today. And I'm not even sure what the what we what we tell young people to go do to go find a job. Um, but what I'll tell you is that I started off in a large company, chemical business. Um, it was Fortune 50 company. I worked there for 20 years. I left that. I became a would-be art gallery owner. I figured out that there wasn't any money in that and that I would end up being more like the starving artists. And uh, so I, you know, I, I got out of that and uh, they went into real estate. I built homes. So I ran a real uh, a home building company for a few years. Then I switched out of that and started a, believe it or not, mold remediation company. And while I was in uh, the mold remediation business, I really was, uh, what really happened for me there was I started figuring out that one question, what was my purpose? What do I really want to do? And what, what really drove me? And um, one of the comments that Emily had made in her tips was to, um, to be a lifelong learner. And when I graduated from engineering school, I said, I'm done. No more school. I'm done. And I'm not, I don't need to learn any, I'll learn what I need to learn along the way. And you know, that, that last, what, you know, I, I think the third week of my job, they sent me away to another school to learn some more stuff that I didn't learn yet and all that. So learn that, well, maybe there is something more to this, but it took me 20, no, excuse me, 30 years to go back to college. 
So 30 years later, I went to, and, and joined the MSOD program at Pepperdine. And there's a reason for that. And um, part of it goes to that first point of mine, get a mentor or four. And why do I say that is mentors are special and they mentor you the way that they're, they're going to mentor you for you, but from them. So if you just use one mentor, now you have your head and their head working towards your, your growth, your career. And I'm not sure that's good enough. And especially in today's society. So it's like, no, I want, I want five heads working towards my direction. Where am I going? So it's get, get more than one mentor, four is a good number. And how do you get a mentor? Everybody, I've been asked that before. How do, how do I find a mentor? And I, my answer is ask, just simple. Just find somebody who you think has good thoughts and then ask them if they would mentor you. But make sure you have a relationship with them first. You wanna make sure that you know who they are. You kind of really know something about them that you wanna be mentored by. Because I have been surprised when I've asked people and then we have conversations and it's like, oh, you know, maybe this isn't the person for me. And maybe this isn't the kind of mentoring that they wanna do is not what I want. So you wanna ask and you wanna have a conversation. Um, so you kind of heard my story of getting to be where I am today a little bit there. And then it goes to my second point. Be open to new opportunities. They might even look like detours in your career and they turn out later if you, you, if, you know, when you use them, they aren't. So an example is, so I was an engineer, my wife got promoted to another company, left the company, left the city and state we were living in. So detour number one, I had to go to my company and say, I want to move. And they said, well, we have no jobs like what you do there. And it's like, oh, what kind of jobs can you have for me there? And voila, my first detour, I went from being engineering into marketing because they could, they could tolerate me in mark well, not tolerate, but they could, they could give me a job in marketing where I could do it in my new town. A second detour came two and a half, three years later when we moved again, only this time I had to tell my, client, my company, hey, I'm moving and I wanna go here, but I don't wanna do what I'm doing anymore. I wanna do this over here. And because I asked, they said, yes, they let me do that. And that was when I discovered that, you know, that here was a detour in my career, no longer engineering, not even tied to engineering. This was now market development. And it was taking me in a direction I hadn't ever even considered. It was giving me a different business perspective. It was giving me a different perspective on people. Because in that role, I had to learn more about who was, as anybody here in sales would know, who are you actually selling to? Who are you actually working with? And what motivates them? And so that detour now became, oh, this is something that actually really was interesting to me and really deeply embedded in, in, in who I was and the purpose I was trying to create for myself. I then started doing personal learning. I was on this, I got on this, you know, deep personal learning tour, which included doing things like landmark education, uh, finding odd programs out there. And, and, you know, back then, okay, guys, this was cassette tape programs for some of us who remember cassette tapes. Uh, later, those became discs. Uh, but um, people like Napoleon Hill, and uh, which whose message still rings true today, even though it was on cassette. But I became I got on that learning curve and started to to follow that path. Along the way, my wife went and uh, got her MSOD from Pepperdine, and I and I started to bump into this new community of the of the MSOD alumni, and in the, in that community, I started to 
have conversations with people about what were they really doing. And a lot of times it's like, well, we get our OD degrees and we don't do OD as a career. We become, and I, I met people who were running companies, but they're using their OD degree to help them run their company. So it was like, what's out there? And uh, so my next point, don't be afraid to dream big, right? You can find what you want through your dreams. And if you dream little, you end up doing what I was doing originally, just little job improvements along the way. And then it became bigger job improvements. I was willing to leave the company and start a business. I was willing to quit a business and start a new business. I was willing to fire everybody who had gone into business with me to make the business better. All because I started to dream bigger and think bigger than what I was. My next point, ask for what you want until you get it. A lot of us and me, I was one of these guys. Hey, I wanna do this. I'm sorry, James, you can't have that. Okay, what do I do next? And uh, I learned along the way that if I asked again and again, and again, and again, and a few more times, eventually I got what I wanted. And it was, I found that in my marriage. I found that in my uh, work. And so um, about 10 years before I got into the business I'm in now, closer to 14 years actually, I said I wanted to be a coach and had a dream for being a coach. And Lori and I both decided, eh, being a mold remediator, you don't need to have coaching. So let's not do that. And it was, no, you know what? I want to be a coach. So for the next 14 years, once a year, it would come up. And finally, I said, I want to be a coach. And Lori said, come join the company. And I signed up for coach school. Which leads me to the very last point I have here. You are never too old. And it is never too late to go for your dreams, to go for what you want, to go get another education. It was 30 years after I graduated from, with my bachelor's that I went and started my uh, MSOD degree. So it's never too late. Thank you. So I think we're, um, Nicole, I think we're going into some folks probably have a lot of great questions for us. We are. Wow. Thank you, James. Thanks for that transition. Um, thank you to the panel. I think it's been a, a great discussion. Um, I will encourage you to, if you have questions for the panelists, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I have one that um, as you all were sharing, kind of came to my mind. Um, can you share out some publications or books or authors that um, maybe all three of you or if someone is, you know, really wanting to share, um, what do you subscribe to? What do you um, listen to? Is it a podcast? Is there a specific direction where you kind of get insight, um, especially for emotional intelligence and how to manage that on a daily basis, right? Especially pandemic. <laughs> totally. I'll just share one now. I think I mentioned it. I think I mentioned it in my talk is, you know, working for Brene Brown. I subscribe to a lot of her work and Dare to Lead is a great, what, a great book on how to like apply her work to the workplace. Um, and it really hits on those key elements of an emotional intelligence as well. Um, and she now has a podcast with the same name, which I think I just saw today won a Bubby Award. So that's cool too. So um, encourage that. And the other thing that I love is I really like just checking out Harvard Business Review. There's just so many good things there. And so I try to stay on top of that. I like Simon Sinek. I think, I think that he speaks a truth that, um, you know, note, I didn't say the truth. I said a truth, but he, he speaks a truth that uh, you can challenge yourself with and it's kind of a take his information or leave it. And I just love that he, it's up to us to choose it, so. 
Yeah, I would just add um, Harvard Business Review, um, you know, just kind of what's happening in the literature, um, you know, studies that McKinsey and company are, are doing. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of work around research around the future of work. Um, and so anyway, just any of those consortiums or, you know, the uh, Institute for Corporate Productivity, there's a lot of studies and such around culture and uh, whatnot that I always like to read. Um, and then, um, so that's, you know, just kind of more around the field, but also just personally, um, you know, learning more about kind of my own um, uh, inclusion journey. And so joining, uh, we have a number of employee resource groups uh, within the company. So I'm, um, you know, uh, participating in those to just kind of broaden my, you know, back to the never stop learning. Um, so let me under better understand kind of the uh, experience of those that, you know, um, may have been, you know, have been marginalized or, you know, um, just again, learning, 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 learning. And then how can I be, um, you know, show up and be an ally for, for folks. Great. Um, another question came in from Alexa and she's asking, how would you reference a skill on your resume that was self-taught? For example, coding. I, I'm a huge fan of like, I don't know if it's a newer model of doing resumes. I'm not a resume expert, but I'm a huge fan of a summary and skill section at the top of your resume. I think that like we know these days recruiters or anyone's going to spend like, I think it's more between three to seven seconds on your resume. So having those key things in a summary and a skill section right at the top um, I found to be helpful. And when I review resumes, that's what I, I'm, I love when I see that. Cause I'm like, oh, there's a summary, the executive summary section. Well, and I think it's, um, you know, I love that because, you know, emphasizing the things that what, what even motivated you to do that. Right. So that's proving that you can learn a new skill and pick it up and, you know, and then what was, you know, what was the outcome of that, right? You know, did you write a bunch of programs? Did that lead you someplace, you know, to make other connections? And so, you know, the kind of the so what, like, where did that, where did that take you? Um, but I was speaking to someone recently who um, wanted to get into more of a technology type of role. Um, the person didn't have, um, you know, a college degree, so was really concerned that that was, something holding him back but you know we started talking about something else like music oh my gosh you like started a recording company and all that I was like okay well let's talk about like what were the skills that you used to in order to do that oh okay you're a learner you jump in you take risks da, da, da. so that so many of those are transferable skills and so you know what can you actually teach and learn on the job versus kind of what is it about you as a as a person that you know is just intrinsically there that you know, you can't necessarily teach. So um, that's kind of how I would maybe think about it in terms of representing it. Nice. Um, another question came in, um, Christine, thank you for this. It's specifically to James, but I will pose it to the panel as well. I think it's a, a great question to um, ask James, you specifically, can you elaborate on the transition from engineering into business? And I just wanted to mention, I think for the panel, all of you had a transition in your um, career that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. So is there any little nuggets, right? Sometimes going from one industry to the other, one functionality to the other, is there any other nuggets that you can give to, to explain how you got into business or maybe even the MSOD program at Grazadio? Yeah, I can start with that is that, um, yeah, because I, I really look at it as I had two major transitions, right, from being an engineer and um, uh, and then into business ownership and then into doing OD and, and executive coaching. Um, the, 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 the key things that I say are with engineering, you have the math, you have the logical thought process, you have the systems thinking. And that's one of the things I think a lot of that's missing in a lot of businesses is that systems thinking. So with that, I was able to transition into running you know, and setting up business um, because I could make the, I could look at things and see the system in it. And that's really, you know, businesses are really a system of systems, 
if you will. Um, so that that was the what I would say was the the um, pivot point, if you will, uh, that that made it possible for me to make that transition. I would say um, for me, it was um, uh, it's the connection, right? It's the relationships, the networking. Um, in many ways, when I think about kind of my different careers, so from a software developer, then into internal audit, I mean, so within the, the same company, but, you know, it was through a connection of, um, I don't even remember how I got the, that one, but um, I really just kind of followed, followed previous managers, frankly, from company to company. Um, and so again, making those connections, um, when I had gone to school and got my o, OD degree, um, I was working within a, a business unit at the company, um, and but I had had several conversations with our HR director. I was like, "Hey, I'm really interested in this, you know, this type of work, this type of role." And so he agreed to be my sponsor. You know, he would introduce me to others that are doing more of that work. So you know, having the network, the sponsor, the sponsorship um, was super beneficial. Um, you know, people, if you just ask, um, they're for the most part, very generous with their time as well. Um, so being able to shadow and, you know, just, you know, being, being explicit with kind of what you want. <laughs> I think just one other thing I'll add on here that's been helpful for me is um, I shifted, it wasn't a huge shift, but from L&D into sales enablement. And then there were a lot of people in sales enablement being like, you don't have experience in this. You don't have experience in sales. And so I was calling mentors and being like, hey, you know me, you know my experience, you're in this place, help me position myself and would test things with them. And that was another way that helped, helped me a lot. So meeting a few people in that, um, in that field and being able to talk to them, share a little about your experience, get their perspective on how to like morph it was super helpful for me. Such great answers. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Um, I think we're almost out of time for today's session. So I just wanna thank you again. Thank you for joining today's session. Uh, we do have quite a few events coming up. Um, and so I encourage you to stay connected with our office um, in regards to this series. We have session five, which will be on June 17th. And then we have session six of the series, closing it out on July 15th. So we hope to see you again. We have a um, plethora of events going on. So um, the slide deck will be shared with you in the closing email. But thank you for today. Thank you for joining our session. Continue to be lifelong learners and continue to know Grazadio is here to support you. Be well, thank you.